there are places to show vulnerability, but when your vulnerability is getting in the way of your confidence, your faith that we're going to get through this, your ability to absorb uncertainty for people, that's where I think it gets in the way. Being willing to say, I don't know, is not, you know, it, 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 in a way it's kind of vulnerable. You're not pretending that you know something you don't. But at the same time, it's also not abrogating your leadership responsibility to help people grapple with uncertainty. People get paralyzed by uncertainty. My guest today is Rita McGrath. She was actually a guest on the show in 2020 and is making a repeat appearance today. She's a best-selling author of numerous books, including her most recent one called Seeing Around Corners. She's also a longtime professor at Columbia Business School. Rita received the number one award in strategy from Thinkers 50 and is one of the top 10 management thinkers in the world. When it comes to anything related to strategy and innovation, you will not find anybody out there who is smarter, more talented, and more capable than Rita. In today's discussion, we look at what Elon Musk is doing with Twitter and if it's a good idea or not. We will also take a look at the current strategy for Meta and if they are on the wrong track, what really happened to Kodak, and how to identify and act on personal inflection points, and much more. If you are a subscriber to Leading the Future of Work Plus, which I hope you are, you will also get access to a bonus episode where Rita talks about how to create a strategy spine and how to lead in an uncertain world. Subscribers get access to a weekly bonus episode, ad-free listening, and early access to new episodes. Let's get right into this episode with Rita McGrath. Hey, Rita, welcome back to the show. It's been a long time. It has. I think the last time we saw each other was actually in person. Was it? Oh, my I goodness. Once upon a time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's been years. I mean, you were guest on the show, I think, in 2020. Um, I don't remember what month in 2020, but I think it was right before or right around the pandemic when it was being called a pandemic. So quite a lot has changed since then. Um, so why don't we jump right into an easy question first, and that is, what do you think about what's going on with Elon Musk and Twitter? Oh, what a, um, yeah, it's a, it's a, show, it's an epic show for the ages, right? Using into the conversation. Um, well, you know, there, yeah, there's good things to be said about it and not so good things to yeah. be said about it. I think from a human point of view, what he's doing is very painful and yeah. possibly damaging to the company over the long run. So, um, you know, he's um, he's betrayed a lot of people's trust. And I don't think given appropriate recognition in many cases to how much, you know, heart and soul people poured into Twitter. Yeah. Um, and if you look at Jack Dorsey, who came before him, and, and many people have many criticisms of him, but I think he was a very human leader. Um, and Musk seems to be trying to turn the ship the opposite direction. Now, yeah. from a business point of view, you may say, look, what he's got to do is blow it up before he can reconstruct it. I've heard that argument being made. Um, so you could say, well, what, you know, it's a burnt, it's, you know, it's a scorched earth territory. Nothing, nothing was there that can be salvaged. And yeah. he's going to take it in a whole new direction. But certainly from a perspective of, would you want to wake up in the morning and this is the guy you're going to go to work for? I'm not so sure. Well, you know, it's also interesting because I think when a lot of people think about leadership, right, most CEOs are typically not owners of companies like Elon. And so I'm trying to imagine, right? I mean, there's a difference between being a CEO of a company and you work at a company and maybe you have a little bit of equity stake and how you treat people. But then I also understand Elon comes in, he's now the owner of the company. It's his, his company for the most part. And he's realizing they're losing a million dollars a day. And mm -hmm. I'm trying to imagine a scenario. Has this happened before that you can recollect where the CEO is actually the owner of the company the way that Elon is and is making these types of decisions? Because I think it's a little bit of a different dynamic for him, isn't it? Well, you see it a lot in private equity. Yeah. Um, you know, you see, you see private equity guys come in and they, they look around and they say, where are all the opportunities to cut costs and shore up efficiencies and so forth? So you do see that. Um, and often it ends really badly. Um, you know, I mean, they're owners, but they're owners with a short time frame. And I think yeah. that makes the big difference. I, I do give Musk credit for thinking for the long term. I mean, he thinks big, he thinks long term. He's willing to try novel solutions. So, for example, what he did with his battery manufacturing plant in Nevada was brilliant. Yeah. I mean, instead of the usual prescription for building a big plant, which is, you know, you put three years of investment in before you have anything to show for it, um, he built it in a modular way. 
And mm. so he had benefits coming in all along the way. So, you know, a lot of what he's done is really smart. And then a lot of what he's done is just you sort of look at him and you go, you know, why why are you doing it that way? Like there's an easy, there's got to be a more humane way to do things yeah, than the way that yeah. you're doing it. Right now. And I know he's also been criticized. And I was talking to another CEO who was on the podcast, uh, the co-CEO of uh, Warby Parker, uh, who's also in, in, in New York. And, you know, Elon has also been criticized a lot for having beds now in the offices and getting people to work hard. And I've had a few candid conversations with some CEOs about this, and there's a lot of differing of opinion. Uh, some people online are saying, oh, you're creating such an inhuman workplace because you're forcing employees to work so much. But the flip side of the argument is that employees are so excited about the work that they're doing that they are willing to stay there, right? I mean, nobody's chaining them mm -hmm. into the offices. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm curious to hear your take about um, maybe that specific aspect of it. If employees sure. are so committed and excited, right? Elon Musk, you know, he, he has a reputation of being this great visionary to, to work with and for. Maybe the employees are just so excited to be there that they're happy to sleep on the Twitter, uh, you know, floors and in the, you know, the beds in the offices. Well, maybe. And, and, you know, without knowing what their true motivations are, it's very hard to f form an outside judgment. I would say, though, in the current atmosphere where you've got massive layoffs, including at Twitter, you've got people kind of looking around going, am I going to be employed in two months and I've got a newborn and I've got food on the table, you know, and if that's what's expected of me and I feel coerced into doing it, yeah. you know, that would be one lens yeah. through which to look at it. The other lens, of course, is the one you've just outlined, which is I'm super pumped. I want to be here. This is where, you know, there's no place I'd rather be. And I, I would like to think we've all had experiences like that where there was nothing as, as you know, like having to go to bed, having to eat a meal. It was just a, an interruption in what you were really passionate about doing. And so if that's the spirit people are bringing to it, I think that's great. There's one more nuance to that, though, that I think is um, um, seldom talked about, which is if you take the, the forging of young people's professional capabilities, uh, I, think, I think about it as you know, kind of a cauldron or a, or a, or a, you know, a, a trial by fire where you're really forcing people to, to rise to those extreme levels of performance. Um, and there's been some work done on, on professional service firms and other like very high performing professions, do doctoral, you know, residencies mm -hmm. for doctors would be another example, where what you're trying to do is really forge this, this you know, set of capabilities very fast by putting it, people under extreme stress. Um, and so there is a case to be made for younger people that that's a way of building up this um, capability set. But if you feel coerced into doing it, but you know, that that's not no. great. The other thing I would add, though, is, you know, we do know that productivity reaches diminishing returns. Um, you know, we know that our brains can only focus for so long on so many things. We know that after a while, you know, mistakes start to creep in. And if you're just exhausted all the time, you're not going to be producing your best work. So yeah, all those things have to go into the balance. But if it's a question of, hey, we'll make, you know, nap pods available for you. And if you want to be here, God bless them. That's great. Do you want to learn how to create an amazing corporate culture while avoiding the pitfalls that make for a toxic one? If so, I created a brand new eight part training video series just for you. In total, it's around 30 minutes in length and you can get it right now by going to helpmyculture.com. Go there right now before this training series disappears forever. Again, that is helpmyculture.com and get access to this free eight part training series on how to create an amazing corporate culture. Yeah, the context really matters. Uh, but it sounds like your advice to Elon, if he called you and said, hey, Rita, I'm going to go into Twitter. I'm thinking about uh, laying off 70% of the workforce. You wouldn't be like, go for it, Elon. You'd probably say, yeah, you might want to take a step back. There's probably a better way to do that. Well, I would have started long before that. Yeah. <laughs> I would have started with what were you thinking when you made that bid for the company to begin <laughs> with? You know? um, and as you know, I do a lot of work on planning under uncertainty. And one of the things we always start off with is, well, what does success look like? Mm -hmm. well, you know, if you're going to bid $44 billion for something, you must have a pretty interesting idea of what success could look like in your mind. And I don't know this, but of course, I don't know Elon Musk at all, but it strikes me that it was a rash move um, that that you know perhaps in the cooler 
hours to follow, he suddenly said, hang on, you know, do I really need to spend that kind of money to grab that asset? And once being basically forced into buying it, now he's got to come up with some breakthrough strategy that's going to take Twitter on a completely different trajectory. So yeah. I think there's phases to this decision. And, and I probably would have been advised him a lot earlier, you know, proceed with more caution before yeah. you start waving billions of dollars around. Yeah. And I, I hear, uh, I think he's been tweeting about this, right? He wanted, he wants to turn Twitter into uh, what is it like the, the everything app, like Twitter X or something like that, where you can basically do, do everything and anything on it. And I think in, in yeah, like he and everybody else, right? Yeah. And, I think you know, in China, WeChat's they have something like that. In, in China. <laughs> exactly. Know, like, this is not a new thing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it remains to be seen, I guess, what will happen with that. Um, speaking of another big tech company, I know you've also talked a lot about Meta, aka uh, mm -hmm. Facebook, back in the day. Mm -hmm. What do you think about what's going on over there? Because they've also been very much criticized with their business decisions, right? Going all in on Meta, and activist investors are like, "Are you are you out of your mind? <laughs> you're you're basically putting all your money into this virtual world that looks and and you know is just terrible." What do you think's going on over there? Well, I put Meta kind of where BlackBerry was in 2011. Okay. That would be my, my sort of equivalent, which is still very wealthy, still very powerful, still very influential, still meaningful to an awful lot of people's lives. I mean, there are a lot of people whose you know, day to day would be much less full and rich without that company. Um, at the same time, you know, this idea that we can will an entire ecosystem into being all at once. I've just seen more great companies brought down by that hypothesis than mm. perhaps any other, which is, you know, you've got an unripe ecosystem. Everybody knows it. It's going to take decades to unfold the yeah. full metaverse, whatever. And, you know, what Zuckerberg's analogizing is um, the transition between Facebook, the desktop, and Facebook, the mobile. But mobile phones were much more mature as an ecosystem than the metaverse is now. I mean, mm. it was a pretty odd... By the, by the time they did mobile, by the yeah. way, everybody had been saying they were five years too late. So it wasn't like it was a brand new ecosystem he had to bring into being. This is a completely different animal, and I think he's applying the same logic to it. So what do you think... So one of the things I find interesting is it, it seems like both Elon and Zuckerberg, a lot of people are arguing they're going off in, in the wrong directions. And both of these are obviously very known and famous business leaders, multi-billionaires, yet they both seem to be veering a little bit off course, or so a lot of people would say. What do you think that they're missing? Uh, do you think that during their decision-making process, whether it was to go all in with Meta or to acquire something like Twitter, was there a step along the way that they missed when they were trying to figure out if this was a a good business decision or a strategy for them? <laughs> I wouldn't say so much as a step as an architecture. Um, uh, and so yeah. one of the things that happens when you get super rich and super powerful and, you know, everybody around you knows it, right? And you're regarded as a genius and everybody who's in your immediate circle tells you how smart you are morning, noon, and night. Um, there's nobody to say, mm. this isn't a good idea or have you thought about the flaws in this proposition or hang on, you know, you may not be right about this one. And so one of the big problems that happens to people in roles like that, and we saw it, we see it with corporate people too, you know, you saw it with Jeff Immelt at GE, yeah. is they surround themselves by people who are an echo chamber. Mm. And so there's nobody to say, hey, hang on, have you thought about the logical implications of what you're trying to do or I don't know that you're right about this or let's let's challenge that one and I think that's if I were to say missing step it's not so much that step it's that you you're creating the context in which you can yeah. do any damn thing you please yeah. and there's nobody to say absolutely you know that's not a good idea so what's the solution because I feel like you don't have to be a CEO to fall into that problem you could even be like a mid-level leader yeah. of a team a senior leader of a, of a function and this is a very very common theme right so how mm -hmm. How can leaders across the board avoid falling into that trap of, you know, going in the right direction and nobody's, nobody's saying anything to them? Well, you may be going in the wrong direction and nobody's saying anything. Well, the first big challenge is, is diversity of perspective. Um, so certainly the normal things we think of when we think of diversity, so diversity of background, diversity of gender, diversity of um, race. Um, but I think diversity of perspective. So, you know, if you're an engineer, bring in 
you know, a literature major, if you're somebody who's always kind of 30,000 foot, bring in somebody who likes to sort of count grains of sand. If you're, you know, if you've got, if you've got a, a whole management team full of Ivy League educated, basically white people, um, you know, bring in somebody from a working class background who actually has a better feel for what's going on on the ground. So I think the first principle is you really want to hear from diverse voices. And then I think the second principle is you want to get out to the edges. And I, yeah. I read about this in my most recent book, which is, you know, that's where the things are happening you need to know about. And there's simple techniques you can use. And in fact, um, I've written a piece for uh, Dialogue, the magazine about this, which is you can institute no interruption rules, right? Yeah. You can practice the nominal group technique, which is a, um, a technique for basically gathering input from diverse people before you allow people to shut each other down or shut each other out. You can have um, something like what uh, Gisbert Rule did at Klockner and institute a non-hierarchical communication system anybody can access. And, you know, his position as, as CEO, his position was to his whole company. If anybody sees something I you think I ought to know about and you think I don't know about, you, you tell me. Yeah. Like, send me a text. Don't make it all formal. Send me a quick <laughs> note. So there's things you can do to instrument that, that flow of information from the edges. And I think that's what's really critical. Yeah. So for selfish reasons, uh, I have a question for you about vulnerability. This is the subject of a new book that I'm working on, which will come out uh, October, November 2023, and specifically oh, wow. vulnerability from a leadership perspective. So I interviewed 100 CEOs so far on this and, and surveyed around 14, 15,000 employees. Uh, so it's a, it's a, to me, it's a very, very fascinating space. But I'm curious to get your take on the role that vulnerability plays specifically for leaders. Does that come up in conversations when you're talking to various CEOs and, and, and consulting? Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. Oh, all the time. Um, it goes together with authenticity and, you know, bringing your whole self to work yeah. and this whole clutch of things that we're now beginning to realize matter to leadership. So a couple of observations about vulnerability. People want to know that you're competent first. Yes. So coming, leading with your vulnerability, you know, I'm not sure that's so great, right? You come and you say, well, last night I was up all night. I was sweating bullets because I'm not sure I'm up for this job. But, you know, if you guys will kind of hang in with me, I think we can. I mean, that's not going to inspire and galvanize it's, people. So and, I think there's ways to use vulnerability yeah. and there's ways um, uh, not to, right? And, and I think that's so I think, uh, also, before sorry, you jump in, I think that's also very unique for leaders because, Leaders specifically are the ones responsible for other people, for dollars and cents. And so I think one of the things that makes vulnerability different for leaders versus non-leaders is that if, you know, if I'm just Jacob in accounting and it's, you know, my, I'm at the company for one year and I'm having a tough day, a lot of people probably won't take what I say so seriously, right? They'll maybe take me out for lunch and say, hey, it sounds like you're having a bad day. Are you okay? But if I'm a leader going into the company saying, oh my goodness, I don't know what I'm doing, this and that, all of a sudden you're creating panic and fear and uncertainty and you have a far greater impact on other people than if you were not in a leadership role. So I love that you mentioned competence. That's also one of the things that a lot of CEOs are telling me. They're like, yeah, vulnerability is great, but you still need to be good at your job. Otherwise, the vulnerability can be a double-edged sword for you. Yeah, and where I would plug vulnerability in is something that uh, Thomas Kolditz writes about. So he wrote a wonderful book called um, In Extremist Leadership, and he used to teach people in um, West Point. I mean, he was their, their leadership expert at West Point, and he studied people that were effective leaders in very dangerous situations, so mm -hmm. really high-stress situations. What was his name again? Is, uh, his name is Tom Kolditz, oh, K-O-L-D-I-T-Z. Okay, I'm going to write his name down. Yeah, he's awesome. You should talk to him. He's amazing. Um, but one of the things he talks about is he said, you know, the, the, the way vulnerability comes into it is that um, if you're asking somebody to follow you into a you know, super dangerous situation, one of the things they need to feel is that you are in kinship with them, mm -hmm. that you, you share things in common, that you've built a common bank of trust, that you've got that, that kind of trust in the bank, as it were. And as, as he likes to say, that's built over time. That's not yeah. built, um, you know, like just as needed, right? And so where I think vulnerability fits into that is those sort of casual conversations about, uh, you know, oh, geez, my teenage son, you know, I'm just, I don't know even how to talk to him. And being able to sort of authentically say, oh, you know, I, I get where you're coming from. That's an issue for me, too, yeah. sometimes. Um, and so I think there are places to show vulnerability. But when your vulnerability is getting in the way of your confidence, 
your faith that we're going to get through this, your ability to absorb uncertainty for people. Mm -hmm. That's where I think it gets in the way. Um, So let me talk a minute about absorbing uncertainty, because I think I think somehow in this whole notion of, oh, you know, everybody's empowered and we're going to have permissionless teams and we're all going to be vulnerable and authentic. I remember Holacracy. Remember Holacracy when everybody thought that was a thing? You know, everybody's forgotten now we had quality circles before that and we had, what was it, um, boundaryless organizations before that. I mean, this comes and goes every couple of years. But um, amidst all that, what I think people that you are leading want to know is what's expected of me right now today? Right. Um, And so if you can absorb that uncertainty and the ways that you do that don't have to be inauthentic. It can be, look, here's what I know. Based on what I know, here's what I think the most important three things are that we need to do today. Mm. Here's where you fit into those important three things. And when I learn more, I'll be back to you. Right. So being willing to say, I don't know, is not you know, it's it, it, in a way, it's kind of vulnerable. You're not pretending that you know something you don't. But at the same time, it's also not abrogating your leadership responsibility mm. to help people grapple with uncertainty. People get paralyzed by uncertainty. Yep. And so being able to say, okay, you know, let's just take the current economic situation. You know, we're going into a situation where revenues may be down 20% next year. But that, 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 that is a possibility I'm considering. If that's the case, what I would like you to do is put together what your plan B is. Like put together what your contingency plan would be if that happens. Hmm. Now, let's hope it doesn't happen. But if it happens, I'd like you to prepare, you know, to, yeah. to, to take the lead on being prepared for that. So that, that's an example, right? So it's, it's saying, I'm not sure this is going to happen, but... In case it does, here's the actions I think we should be taking. Why do you think so many leaders struggle with vulnerability um, in the context of, you know, being able to say, I don't know, or ask for help or share any personal information, you, you know, if it creates trust. It seems like a lot of leaders struggle with this. You know, Jeff Immel was one of the people that I've interviewed and he told me that one of the biggest mistakes he made during his leadership career is not saying, I don't know enough. And Mm -hmm. is this just because of the stereotype of leadership that we've had over the years? Do we just not teach this in schools? Like why, why is this such a hard thing for people to grasp? Well, I think, um, I think it's a complex thing. I think, you know, our expectations of leaders are kind of, you know, man on horse waving sword, follow me. Right. And, and so, you know, expressing doubts or vulnerability or saying, I don't know, that is sort of jarring when you contrast it with that. So I I think historically we've put a huge premium on leaders knowing the direction and telling us what to do, Mm -hmm. courageously leading the way. Um, So that's one whole layer. I think the second layer is really, you know, even today, a lot of our leaders are still men. And I think men are just raised with a very different set of expectations about what they can express in terms of their own emotions, what they can feel comfortable talking about in terms of their own fears, their own weaknesses, their own self-doubts. Um, and there is actually a bunch of research that supports this. You know, the, the women, especially in all women groups, are much more likely to, you know, say, oh, yeah, I had that problem. You should have heard what happened last week, blah, 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 blah you know, whatever. Um, whereas men aren't socialized as mm-hmm. much that way. So men are much more likely to, uh, you know, my sports team lost and that crushed me, you know, but it's not, that's not a very superficial conversation. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> um, and so I think, I think maybe men are not given enough opportunity to get in touch with those uh, things. So I think that's the second thing. And I think a third thing is um, if you are in a situation of anxiety and you are in a situation of some self doubt, it's almost like it reinforces that mm-hmm. if you say, well, and then on top of it, you know, I have all the, uh, I'm going to expose my self doubts to everybody else. What if I really am a fraud? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so the whole yeah. imposter syndrome comes into it then. Yeah. Yeah. There are a lot of challenges there and, and you bring up some great points. Um, I also wanted to touch on one, one other company. Uh, so we talked about Tesla, we talked about, um, uh, Meta. And I saw that fairly recently you also did something about Kodak and you said, what really happened to Kodak? Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. Kodak is oftentimes used as a case study around what happens when you don't, you know, pay attention to what's going on. And, you know, they missed the digital revolution, so to speak, and uh, they they didn't get involved with digital cameras. It's kind of used as like the analogous blockbuster to Netflix scenario, right? Um, But you put something out that said that's not quite what happened to Codex? I thought we could talk about that's that for a few minutes. Happened. Why did they go down? Yeah, that's not what happened. So the trope is, right, that Kodak missed the digital revolution. They didn't. Um, they, for 20, 2005, 2006, in fact, Kodak sold in the United States the most 
popular digital camera ever made. Um, the problem is it was a digital camera and it didn't have a lot of competitive insulation around it. And so it was a very competitive market. So the margins weren't great. So they weren't nearly as good as the film margins. So I think this whole notion of Kodak not doing digital right was was kind of a misunderstanding. But I think a much deeper misunderstanding mm. is the whole political dynamics behind it. So um, Kodak uh, was run by a whole succession of CEOs um, who were trying to take the company and really modernize it and come up with the office of the future and you know come up with these new kinds of things. Um, and there's a guy called Antonio Perez, who at the, the time that I'm thinking of was uh, lost out at Hewlett Packard in the CEO battle uh, to Carly Fiorino. And Perez had made his career on HP's printing business. Um, so he had grown that business to like a $10 billion business from nothing. I mean, it was a phenomenal success story. Yeah. Um, and so after he sort of lost this, this CEO battle, he was sort of looking at his wounds and thinking, well, what do I do next? And so they formed a joint venture between Kodak and HP to explore kind of different ways that the companies could partner. He at one point reportedly made a couple of attempts to have HP acquire Kodak, which never happened. Um, and then eventually in 2003, I want to say, he got the nod to take over as Kodak CEO. Um, and now remember, so this guy, talk about ego, talk about vulnerability. This guy's lost out to, you know, Fiorina. He's sort of been under her thumb now for three years, uh, finally broke it away, got the CEO role, he can do whatever he wants on the planet. And what he decides to do is focus the company on printing mm. at exactly the moment historically when screens were getting good enough that you didn't need to print stuff to see a nice picture. And so, you know, he was basically trying to recreate the glory that he had created earlier in his career at HP. Um, and even at the time this whole initiative was launched, um, there were, there were, there were, very skeptical business analysts saying things like, well, you know, why is Kodak allowing Perez's ego to get in the way of sensible business decisions? I mean, mm -hmm. this is just crazy. Um, and so, like, the human side of it, you just can't yeah. downplay that. And I believe that's what happened. I mean, he, he, he sold off all the high potential, you know, small but very innovative things. So one of the things they did at Kodak, which was great, which was they called it the Eastman Dime. And since the founding of the company by George Eastman, uh, he made a vow that for every dollar the company made in sales, that five cents a nickel, or yeah, the Eastman nickel, the, that five cents would go towards R&D. And so when Perez took over, this company had patents up the wazoo, scientists that were world class. I mean, just a treasure trove of stuff they could have gone out and commercialized. And he was bullheadedly going to go do printing. God damn it. That's what we're going to do. It's crazy. I, I guess that goes kind of back to the story that we were talking about earlier, right? It's what happens when ego gets in the way and nobody's there to sort of check you and tell you like, hey, <laughs> your head's gotten a little big. It's time to take a step back. Like, where was the board? I just don't understand that. Yeah. Like, where was the board? Mm -hmm. So what do you do maybe for ego? Uh, you know, earlier we talked about the importance of surrounding yourself by people, diverse perspectives for decision making. Ego is related, but I also feel like it's a little bit of a different animal, right? I mean, we all have ego in some regards, and the more you climb that corporate food chain, the more power, responsibility, money, the nicer office, the parking spot you get. And all of a sudden, you start, you know, your head gets really big it, without anybody directly telling you, like, hey, you have a big ego, you need to calm down. How do you, is it something that we as leaders can be aware of and, and slow down? Oh, wow. That's a, a big challenge because it, it is hard to challenge yeah. powerful people when they have big egos. I mean, and there was a fascinating study done by my colleague Don Hambrick at Columbia years ago. And what he was interested in was the premium that companies were willing to pay for acquisition targets. Mm -hmm. And he found a distinct like statistically significant overpayment for targets based on evidence of CEO hubris. So this was things like the number of times their picture was on the front page of the National Business Magazine, or the number of times they got quoted as being a really super whatever. Um, so I think it's 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 hard. Um, and part of the problem is if you're the person with the ego, it feels great. Yeah, it's awesome. I mean, you know, you're Jeff Immel, you come to work and every conference room is chilled to exactly the temperature you want it to be, despite the fact that your entire female staff is running around wearing fur parkas, you know, to office. Was that actually what, what happened? Uh, there's your... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, all his, all his team knew exactly what temperature he liked the offices to be, the, the conference centers and everything to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I've talked to women at GE, and they were like, oh, yeah. We we bought, like, like what are those things you wear under ski wear? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thermo, thermo wear? <laughs> uh, you know, like those those leggings and things yeah. you bought under, and they would wear that under their business outfits. It's funny. I'm, it was so cool. I'm going to be talking to him again in, like, uh, a few weeks. Uh, and I told him I want to have a conversation with him about vulnerability and, and, and the workplace and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So maybe, maybe it'll be something yeah. I bring up. Well, so okay, so so the first problem is, do you want to solve it? Yeah, you know, as a leader, yeah. I mean, are you even aware that this is an issue? So you got to get past awareness, and then you got to get to, oh wow, I recognize this is a, a possible setback for me. And really, the only way that I've seen that be countered, and I haven't seen it very often successfully, is really brutal feedback, mm. um, and really brutal mm -hmm. feedback from a variety of stakeholders. You know, just just real honest. Let me tell you, like, what's going on here. Um, and the trouble with a lot of leaders like that is they don't want to hear it. And so they just shut it down. You know, they, they shoot the messenger. They don't want to listen. They whatever. So ego is really tough because unless you have someone equally powerful. And by the way, Blockbuster is a great story because you have this clash of equally powerful egos in that story. So John Antioco was the CEO of Blockbuster mm -hmm. when they were targeted by Carl Icahn. Uh, and Antioco wanted to stop late fees. He wanted to open an on-demand version, which was a combination of on-site and online delivery of video content, which could have killed Netflix. It could have knocked Netflix completely off its perch because Netflix wasn't sustainable yeah. yet at that time. And, um, and ICANN came in and he said, we're not spending the money on that. And Antioco said, but that's the future of the company. And ICANN was like, tough nookies. Mm. <laughs> so Antioco gets fired. They bring in a caretaker CEO who basically runs the company into the ground. And that's another story that gets completely misunderstood. Um, anyway, so unless you have someone very powerful, unless you have some way of curbing it, and unless the person has some kind of, I don't know, Christmas Carol moment where they see the, you know, the ghost of Christmas come to come and they, they realize the error of their ways. It's really, really hard to counteract that. Yeah, I remember I interviewed one CEO. I can't remember who it was, but he, he was telling me a story of early on in his career. Um, he was giving feedback to his then CEO at the time. And uh, his CEO at the time was, was not a very nice person. And uh, this person gave him feedback and said, you know, here's, I think, a better way that you could communicate with your team and you're, you're kind of losing people along the way and you're, you're kind of being mean to everybody. And he told me the CEO's response was, what are you, my marriage therapist? If I want counseling, I'm going to go to my therapist, not from you. And he's like, at that moment, I knew I'm never giving that person feedback again. So nope. yeah, there, there, exactly. there are some leaders out there where you try to give them feedback and they just kind of metaphorically punch you right in the face. And it's kind of like, what do you do in that situation? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But I guess eventually those leaders implode. <laughs> you know, they they are the cause of. Well, they don't, and this is what's fascinating to me. They they don't. So uh, a great book I would recommend to you and to your listeners is uh, Jeff Pfeffer's Seven Rules of Power. Okay. Um, and mm -hmm. what he talks about is he talks about what powerful people do, and you know, step one is they acknowledge they want power. Mm -hmm. Step two is they mm -hmm. show up looking like power. Step three is they communicate with power. Short sentences, very grabby. Uh, step four is they network relentlessly, so they build this whole cadre of other people that are interested in their power. But step five is when they finally get into a position of power, they use it. They use it. Mm -hmm. And basically what they do is they kill off everybody around them, so they eliminate all challenges to their existing power, and then they seek to institutionalize their power in current structures. And then the last chapter mm -hmm. of his book is called Success Excuses Almost Everything. Um, and so one of the sort of little known tragedies of modern business life is how many egotistical leaders, leaders who have run their companies into the ground, they go off and they join boards and they're on charity things and they marry, you know, increasingly younger women and they have nice lives. Right? Golden they parachutes. They don't ever get held to account for the, yeah, they don't ever get held to account for the damage that they've done. And, you know, I'm not a hugely highly, I'm not sitting on a moral whatever, but, but I think Pfeffer's admonition to us is, you know, understand that if you are a successful person, being undone is going to be pretty rare. Just case in point, um, I am told that that the, the Adam Newman, the WeWork guy, that he's being funded with his next round of funding. Oh yeah, he just raised like I forgot an, an obscene amount of money. Case proven, right? I mean, you know, you could not. Could you ask for a more textbook case of somebody 
whose ego got away with him, who told a great story, who wasn't exactly, you know, authentic and vulnerable with his staff, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, regardless of what you think about him as a person, I mean, it's astonishing yeah. that, that people with funds would be willing to invest in him again. Yeah, I was just looking it up as you were speaking, and his company, without having a product or a service, somehow has a $1 billion valuation. So, Isn't that awesome? Which is, I, I mean, kind of speechless to that. Yeah, and I think it was... Uh, so, and, let me... Let me so let me give you some advice on this book you're writing on vulnerability, because I think one of the risks of that, right, is let's not ignore the game we're playing. Yeah. Um, and if you think about powerful people, they actually use their vulnerability very instrumentally. Mm. Um, and I don't mean that necessarily venally, but they're they're very judicious about when they show weakness, when they don't, who they show it to, who's in the inner circle, you know, who's allowed. Um, and if you look at really powerful people, there's some very interesting dynamics there. And yeah. what Jeff would tell you is he said, look, you know, you want to play soccer. You don't come into soccer playing the rules of basketball. You want to play human society. You come in with the rules of human society and you can like it. You can not like it. But these are how human societies over mm -hmm. the millennia have formed their views of power. So I'd encourage you to kind of have that as a perhaps yeah. additional yeah. structure when you're thinking about it. Yeah, no, I mean, I have that in the context of the book as far as like leaders still have a responsibility of, you know, it's not just about showing to, showing up to work and, you know, you know, holding hands and talking about your feelings leaders still very much have a responsibility to their employees, stakeholders, shareholders, etc. Like results and competence, all that sort of stuff still matters quite a bit. Um, but can it also be argued that that idea of business and leadership is changing? For example, you know, if, if Jeff Immel or Jack Welsh, for that matter, were CEOs today, do you think they would be accepted? Because it seems to me, at least from a lot of the CEOs I'm interviewing, is what they're saying is that business has changed and leadership has changed and that for the most part you can't have that same approach in business and in leadership and still succeed in today's world now of course there's still a couple examples of ceos out there that are like that but do you think that we've seen a change in in that dynamic or is it still the same as it was 10 20 30 years ago well some some things are the same and some have changed yeah. i think one of the big things that's changed is that leaders are no longer able to control the narrative. Mm. Um, you know, you know, information leaks. Um, there's two-way communications between companies and their customers. Customers have absolutely no uh, hesitation in letting you know when the companies let you down or the leaders let yep. you down or whatever. Um, it's much more possible for leaders to be exposed at being inauthentic or telling lies or, you know, in other words, the, the information intensity around leaders, I think, is vastly more than it was in the Jack Welsh era, yeah. you know. I mean, we were still sending memos around on Xerox paper in those days. And so if there was a mistake made, it didn't instantly get amplified and ricocheted across everything. So I think that's one thing that really is different. Um, I do think I do think maybe we're getting smarter about the fact that, that corporations are human institutions and that perhaps, you know, we need to treat them as such. We need to be better about, um, you know, allowing people's humanity to express itself at work and, and in, in ways. Um, I also think we're on the brink of a really big uh, transition in the fundamental underlying assumptions of, of how our economies work. And, and here I draw in the work a lot of Carlotta Perez, who talks about big cycles, you know, in, in the world, and that every technology paradigm has an organizational principle that makes sense going with mm -hmm. it. And if you think mm -hmm. about the digital age, right, what we're seeing much more now is no company's an island. We're all competing as ecosystems. Yeah. You know, we're all connected. And so to be that kind of Jack Welsh, number one or number two, my way or the highway, blah, 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 in an ecosystem, that's deadly. Yep. Absolutely yep. deadly. Remember to go to helpmyculture.com if you want to get access to my brand new eight-part completely free training series on how to create an amazing corporate culture while avoiding the pitfalls that make for a toxic one. Not only will you hear from me, but you will hear from best-selling authors, including Daniel Coyle, who wrote The Culture Code, and Aaron Meyer, the best-selling author of The Culture Map and No Rules Rules. You will also hear from Mark Randolph, the first CEO of Netflix, and Jim Heppelman, the CEO of PTC. Again, you can get access to all of this completely free by going to help myculture.com. I hope you find the video training series useful. 
No, it's, it's, it's interesting. And I do think we're seeing some change in the business and leadership world. Um, I mean, obviously a lot of people would argue not as much change, but I remember I was talking to Marshall Goldsmith, um, it was like a month or two ago. And I was asking him, I said, you know, how come we don't have more great leaders out there? And he's like, what are you talking about? He's like, you know, there used to be a time when, uh, you know, if you weren't a good employee, you would literally get your head chopped off. And he said, leaders, we've made a lot of progress, but the challenge is that we've also had much higher expectations. Like the, the, mm -hmm. our expectations are increasing at a far rapid rate than the progress that leaders are making. So we do have better leaders, we do have better businesses and companies, but our expectations are so high and we're, you know, we're wanting so much from our leaders that it's, it's almost not possible to keep up. Do you agree with that? Um, well, this gets back to this idea about, about um, you know, ready access to information. Yeah. You know? When the leader was a remote figure that, you know, you saw maybe, remote, you know, in a room full of 6,000 people once a year at the company offsite, it was much easier for them to keep their true selves to themselves, to keep themselves to a smaller group of people and so forth. When, you know, every day you're able to see what they're tweeting or, or you know, there's this whole sort of rich information play. I do think that has an effect of... It, I think people feel empowered to opine now on on what the leaders are doing. Like you know, everybody everybody's a critic, everybody's a reporter, everybody's a member of the press, <laughs> you know. And so everybody has a point of view about what good leadership is and whether you're up to it or not. Yeah, no, fair point. Um, so maybe one or two more questions before we transition to our uh, section on action items. Uh, I saw that one of the other things that you've been talking about a lot um, fairly recently is how to navigate personal inflection points. And I thought that would be some pretty interesting advice for leaders or aspiring leaders out there. So first is what do you identify as a personal inflection point? Like how do you know that you're in one and what, mm -hmm. what do you do when you know that's the case? Well, an inflection point in general is something that happens that creates a 10x shift. Um, so you know, in business, it would be 10x cheaper, 10x faster, 10x whatever. In personal, it would be you know, something, an opportunity got shut off, I got fired, my my expectation for this is changed by an order of 10, or what I thought I was going to be doing is changed by an order of 10, or I've had some adversity or mishap. And personal inflection points, by the way, often do masquerade as negative events. Mm. Um, you know, we see a lot of people who, you know, get fired or or you know, their company moves and they can't move for family yeah. reasons or there's some setback at home or you know whatever it is it's some personal something and it's often re perceived as negative and so one of the things that i would observe is when you go talk to people who've been through these and kind of emerge the other end a lot of them will tell you that was the best thing that ever happened to me <laughs> you know my 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 getting fired my losing that job my not having to report to my loony uncle you know whatever it oh, was best thing my ever. wife would so definitely think, say that <laughs> she used to work for a big technology company and she always yeah. says that when she got laid off that was the best thing that ever happened to her besides, besides meeting me of course um so <laughs> of course of course but i think so i think i think the first thing is to take a deep breath and sort of Get back and get centered on what what it is you're really trying to accomplish. So one of the other things I think that happens in um, in careers, right, is we get we get very fixated on a particular expression of success. Mm -hmm. So I'll take an example in farm pharma, pharmaceuticals, right? I'll go off and I'll talk to um, you know people that work in farm and I'll say, well, what's you want to achieve? Like, what's your what's your goal? You know, and they'll say things like, I want to be a level three E two, you know, V two. Like they'll name some hierarchical thing yeah, that they yeah, want. Yeah. And, um, and, and it's very hard to get them past it. It's almost like asking an academic, what do you want? And it's always tenure. Or you ask a lawyer, what is it you want? It's to make partner. And, and you know, we get very fixated on these, these, these um, role-based goals when they actually don't necessarily have enough to do with what we really have as our purpose, what we really have as our genuine desire to make an impact in the world. So if I go back to my pharma person, I remember having this conversation with her and I said, um, well, you know, okay, so you want to be this like head of marketing, level three, whatever. What, why do you want to do that? Yeah. And it turns out the answer was, well, because if I was in that role, I could hire great people. I could, I could bring new voices into the conversation. I could take our company in a much more imaginative direction. In other words, all this creative stuff that she would love to do. And I said to her, well, can't you think about um, 
you know, there are many paths to achieve that, right? And so I think from a personal inflection point, what it can often cause you to do is really thrust you into a period of introspection. Mm. And I think for a lot of people, the pandemic has been a big inflection yeah. point, you know, on, on, you know, whether a huge one or whether a modest one. But I know a lot more people are spending time very openly talking about reflection, yep. You know, mental health, well-being, the well-being of my family. Yeah. You know, am I making sure I'm getting enough rest? I mean, all these considerations that kind of would would have been undiscussable before, but mm. are now really up front and center. Yeah, the inflection point reminds me of uh, I play a lot of chess, and um, you know, one of the things that they always say in chess is that eventually you get to what's known as a critical moment. And a critical moment is mm -hmm. something that you need to be able to recognize when you're looking at the chessboard and you identify like this is a crucial moment of the game where kind of like every, mm -hmm. you know, a, a move can really make or break the direction of the game. And it's being able to spot that inflection point. And when you spot it, mm -hmm. you know, okay, I'm, I'm going to spend an extra five or 10 minutes on this move before I make it instead of rushing. So mm -hmm. that's it, kind of the, the analogy that popped into my mind is uh, playing chess and inflection points, spotting them and then taking mm -hmm. time before you, you decide what you want to do. And that's really important. I think what happens sometimes is when we have a crisis, um, I think one of the mistakes people make is they they lurch into the first thing yeah. that that seems to resolve this tension, right? So let's say you lose a job, right? And then you, you know, three weeks later, you get an offer that actually in your heart of heart, you're kind of a little doubtful, but you're so raw from having lost this job and it would it would be such an easy solution to just step right into a new role. And, and you haven't really given yourself the time to first of all, get over the, 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 the sort of whole sequence of fear and grief and despair and, you know, anger and all that yep. stuff you need to get through emotionally. And secondly, you know, not taking the time to say, do I, re is this really yeah. the thing that should be my next move? Yeah. I talked to um, the chief marketing officer at a big tech company uh, called me a few days ago, leaving their current role. And uh, we were talking a little bit and he was telling me that he's considering his next role in his next position. And he was talking to me about some of the roles. One was a big company, one was a startup. And he was saying, you know, I'm not, they're, they're both good. You know, I, I'll, I'll do okay in, in either of them, but I'm, I'm not really sure that they're right for me. And I said, wait, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. take some time. It's the holidays. Don't do anything until mm -hmm. the new year begins because you don't want to rush like this is a critical moment for you and the next thing that you decide on uh you know you want to make sure that you're going into it with kind of the right frame of mind um so yeah i, I like that advice it aligns very much with what you're saying you won't want to miss the rest of this conversation with rita if you subscribe to leading the future of work plus Rita will talk about how to create a strategy spine and how to lead in an uncertain world. Subscribers to Leading the Future of Work Plus get access to a weekly bonus episode, ad-free listening, and also early access to new episodes. I hope you decide to subscribe and support the show. I'll see you next time.